Okay, so first of all, I want to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk to talk here. So in the next minutes, I will try to explain you how you can quantize gravitational perturbations on on Kerr spacetime using some stardom techniques from quantum field theory on on curved sp spacetimes. So that are the one that uh, uh, Mark Casals has masterfully explained us like a while ago. So the idea is pretty simple. So you have your linear Einstein equations on a given on a fixed background, and you want to quantize the solution space of these equations. So on Minkowski space time is pretty easy to do this procedure. So because the equations are separable in some gauge, so you fix your favorite gauge in which they are separable. And by that, I mean that you can write your uh, you, you can decompose your field. Uh, use it with some plane waves or some modes of composition, and then you promote the this linear coefficient, the coefficients of this uh, this decomposition, to be creation annihilation operators, and you have your quantum fields nicely defined. So now, but when you move to to a Kerr space time, it doesn't matter how it looks like. It's I mean it's a mess. It's pretty ugly, but when you move to Kerr space time, these equations are not separable. So this means that it's unclear how to have how to get a mode decompositions, a mode decomposition, and it's unclear how to define then creation annihilation operator. So we really want to improve this situation here. But why? Why we want to do that? So the idea is that every time you want to compute the expectation value of an observable, then you need this mode decomposition. Numerically, you need this mode decomposition. So, for example, imagine that you want to compute the semi-classical correction of the black hole parameters by looking at something that is called canonical energy, which classically is related to correction to the mass, area, and angular momentum of the black hole. So now, if you want to compute the expectation value of this guy, you need to put a net to this guy here and do like the standard mode sum, decomposition, numerical, and so on and so forth. But also, like, if you want to also address question like, is a black hole stable under quantum uh, gravitational perturbation, you need to find an explicit representation of this operator. So the question is, can we do that? Can we find it? The idea is, I mean, the answer is clearly yes. And uh, so the trick is to massage a little bit the Einstein equation. So in particular, you can emphasize some properties of the Kerr spacetime. So you can see uh, that there is like a set of four null vectors. That, and if you are wise, then you can look at this uh, contraction here with the Riemann tensor. You can see that this contraction here with this basis are, uh, are zero, except for this one here that usually co is called Psi2, capital Psi2. So this gives you like some simplification, and in particular, this is known uh, from from the people that do like the uh, gravitational perturbation theory, ring down the ring down phase, for example. That if you look at the perturbed component of these uh, Riemann ten, uh, of the perturbed component of the correct of the corrected Riemann tensor, and then you see that these solve a second order partial differential equation. So this was proven a while ago by Tolkolsky. So that's why this thing here is called Tolkolsky equation, and is usually in usually indicated by O. So now you see that it's really is like super nice equation because it's it looks like has um, uh, a wave equation of a Klein-Gordon field in some external potential, and this external potential is constructed by derivative of this tethered here. So this, this external potential is given. So you have the Kerr metric, you have this external potential, you have Psi2, then you can quantize it. So then you can discuss it. And Tchaikovsky proved that this, is, this equation is separable. So which means that, you, that this thing here, this component here, is uh, suitable for a quantization procedure. And indeed, this was firstly, I mean, we are not the first one uh, that has this idea. But already, Candelas and collaborators uh, explored uh, this quantization procedure. Also, here I want to mention that uh, Marcus Hals has work uh, at some work for the spin one case, so for the electromagnetic gravitational perturbation. 
So what is the problem? I mean, it looks like till here, but there is a problem in this uh, CCH approach that if you want to try to reconstruct uh, the, the metric perturbation, the metric perturbation operator is unclear how to do it. And also, uh, only state, stu state subtraction was performed in uh, this work here. So again, how to then compute renormalized expectation values? We don't want, sometimes we don't want uh, the state subtra subtraction, but we really want the expectation, the renormalized expectation value of, of some observables. So, and here he is, we want to unfold, we want to solve this situation. And the idea is to use something that is called Tolkolsky identity. So here I drop some, some the indexes, but I mean, there are some, some index here and there, but just to make the, the notation easier. So if you take the linearized Einstein equation, then you can find two differential operator S and T such that, that this identity holds between operators. So these are explicitly given, so they are mass. So that just, I don't want to, I don't want to bother you with their expression. But now, once you have this identity here, then you can also introduce some dagger operation and the, you can take the dagger of this identity to get this new identity. Now, uh, and here is where the magic happens. Because you see, if you have something that solves the dagger of the, 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 the Tolkolsky equation, then you automatically have something that is in the kernel of your linearized Einstein equation. So it's a solution of your linearized Einstein equation. And this is the magic because this guy, I said that is separable. So for this guy, you can really write a mode decomposition. On the other hand, though, if you have already a solution of uh, the linearized Einstein equation, then you see that this side, this side here is zero. So then you have that TH must be in the kernel of O. So it must be something that we in the previous slide called C. So it's the, the Riemann, uh, the perturbed Riemann component. So if you plug these two things together, then you see that actually C and phi are not really independent, but are related to this identity here that I will discuss like probably in a couple of slides. So here is the idea. So you first obtain modes for, uh, for your Tchaikovsky field, C and C for the Tchaikovsky field PMC, then you impose this relation here and also you normalize with this symplectic form. And then once you define the field operators, then you can put ads on, on C, which means you put end on your field phi here, and then you can reco reconstruct, reconstruct the, the metric perturbation. It's super easy. So let me give you an example on how you can construct then this representation or if you want state. So uh, as I promised, the Tchaikovsky equation are separable. So this means, you know, already from your kind kindergarten that the equation can be written as uh, in this form here, where uh, this normalization coefficient must, must be uniquely defined up to the phase. This guy here is called spin-weighted spheric spheroidal harmonics. And all the physics is encoded in this Tchaikovsky radial function that is defined by the asymptotic behavior in the at the past horizon and past infinity. So it's the usual business between in modes and up modes. So the point is that for the in and up modes, we essentially know how they look like when you look at the, we exactly know the, the form of this thing in the past null infinity and in the past null horizon. So we can really do some explicit computations. So now we have to impose the uh, normalization condition up here with the, the, with the, the symplectic form. So these at some point should remind you that uh, you are kind of fixing the canonical commutation relations. And also you have to impose the constraint between phi and phi that looks like a sort of spin weighted version of complex conjugation. So now if you plug these two things together, uh, you will get some con normalization condition of this form. So for the in modes, there is not a problem. I mean, it's fine. Omega is always taken positive, so it's fine. But if you look at the up modes, okay, apart from this bunch of thing here, really messy, you have also this object P, this polynomial P, that comes from the fact that this uh, derivative here becomes really non-trivial when you look at close to the horizon. But luckily, uh, we have a proof that this guy is always positive. So uh, Mark has proven, for, has rigorously proven that this is the case for gravitational perturbations. So since this thing can be fulfilled, then 
you can have an explicit expansion of your field operator. You can understand this expansion here. So now when you put an at here, so you are declaring this A dagger and B to be your creation annihilation operator. So this really looks like a complex Klein Gordon, complex Klein Gordon field. So now you define as usual a state to be a state that is the one annihilated by all the annihilation operators. Super easy. Now, in general, clearly on care space time, there is not a unique vacuum state. Uh, I mean, there is this issue about which time coordinate we pick, how we decompose the field and so on and so forth. So usually one requires that the state that you construct are of Adamard form. So which means that the uh, divergence uh, is the say of the two-point function is the same as uh, the, the, the Minkowski vacuum. So this means that you can factorize some singular behavior that is state independent and some smooth reminder that is state dependent. So it's really important then to understand how this thing look like. And in particular, it has been shown uh, that we can compute actually properties of this guy for complex Klein Gordon theory and external potential. So, for example, you can look at the paper by Balakumar and Mustalle. And here it's pretty simple to recognize actually that our field equation look like complex Klein Gordon theory and external potential non, minim non minimally coupled with gravity. So, in particular, you see you have only to apply this dictionary here. So, you have so you can this dictionary here to have some form of this age. For example, if you take only at the if you look only at the the Schwarz, the Schwarzschild case, and you pick the, the the point splitted only in time direction, then you have this form here of the this this Adamard thing here. So you see that this thing is actually is the same as uh, Klein scale Klein Gordon real Klein Gordon, whilst these all ugly objects here comes from the fact that you have an external potential. And also uh, like this coupling here. So now that we can, yeah, okay. So now we can finally uh, discuss divergences. So and so usually this is a pretty slippery argument. So we wear our usually anti-slip socks and do this uh, point splitting uh, renormalization. Renormalization. So you have your observable that in our case must be written in this form. Then you separate the points. Then you uh, remove the part that will lead to divergences. Then you, once you do this, you can take the limit, and what you will get is something finite. So this is so that's why it's really important to have uh, to know this thing at different orders. So, for example, some meaningful observables that we can look at. So, as I said, uh, you can look at this scalar here that is connected to the, the Riemann component. So it's the square, if you want, is the square of some Riemann component. And it was already uh, discussed in the original CCH paper only by step su subtraction, because in there was not clear how to get this object here. But in our case, it's really, it's clear. So you have to apply, you know, the famous reconstruction procedure uh, for, uh, the, the usual reconstruction procedure, and then you will get that the, the divergent part is given by this fourth order differential operator, which makes everything ugly, applied on that. So the formula is, I mean, the, the explicit expression is might be super ugly, but I mean, we know how to compute it. Uh, so our original problem was to compute the canonical energy, and one can prove that actually the canonical energy can be written in terms of the symplectic form in which in one entry you put the Tchaikovsky fields and in the second entry you put this directional derivative where this psi is something that's marked at some point called uh, chi. So it's the horizon killing field. So you want to then compute this thing and you can look at the divergent part of, of its density. And again, it's given by this thing here when we were able to compute A, B, C, and D. And you see that you have like the standard uh, uh, quartic divergence, then quadratic divergence, logarithmic divergence, and the smooth surf. So we, you only have to subtract this thing to something that looks like this. So finally, I arrived to the, the point. So we started to, with the question, can we find explicit representation of your field operator? The answer is yes. 
so you have only to quantize the Tchaikovsky the Tchaikovsky fields as for a Klein-Gordon field. So it's not uh, not harder than a Klein-Gordon field. So then you can also write a mode expansion once you have this operator phi hat. You can write the mode expansion of uh, the if you want the two point function of graviton on Kerr space time in this form. So here I reestablish establish indexes because I know that people like to see indexes. And then you see that uh, you can discuss divergences of observable as Klein, complex Klein Gordon field. And the problem is that the renormalization, so the actual subtraction that I showed you before, is not easy neither in the complex Klein Gordon case. But in principle, we have it. And all this framework is based on if you know how to do things for Klein Gordon theory, then you know how to do things for, for this Tchaikovsky field. So as I want just to mention that similar construction can be done for the electromagnetic case, and that allows you to compute some expectation value of the stress energy density. So here is the motto. So you, you start from something really complex, which is tens on fields and so on and so forth, and then you arrive to something that is really easy to discuss, so klein gordon field. And with this, I want to end, and thank you for your attention. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Claudia. Questions? So maybe I miss it in the where you were talking, but um, so the scalar fields have which kind of couplings with the curvature? Sorry? These are scalar fields, but which kind of coupling do they have with the curvature? The, uh, I, mean, I mean, this is the equation. So the coupling with the curvature is given by this if you want to see it, it's given by this guy here. Or so I, when you say they rep, they are like as color fields, yeah, like are they minimally I mean, coupled or non minimally coupled? Non minimally coupled. So it's uh, the non minimally coupled is like is written in this dictionary here. Okay. So in this translation here. So. Okay. I mean, this is not the rich, the the rich is scalar. It's something. It's a component of the background uh, uh, Riemann uh, tensor. Okay, okay, okay. It's given also this guy is a okay. Split. Thank you. Just as, as a curiosity, I was wondering if there's an analogous trick for Dirac spinners. Yes, there is. Uh we didn't uh uh so yes, there is. You can do the same thing for uh, spin one. I I if I would bet, I would say that if for spin one half and three half, this procedure works. But for higher spin, uh, I would expect that this doesn't work because, I mean, here you have to require some condition of this form on your on your p, and for already for uh, spin greater than three half, this does not work. So I don't expect that if you go higher. I mean, this thing works for spin zero, one, and two, spin one half and three half. If you go higher, it's this thing is not any more satisfying. Things works, you mean that at the end you have a plane Gordon bias? Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. It works means that normalization, this normalization coefficient, this normalization condition, and this constraint can be fulfilled together. I mean, can be fulfilled. Yeah, at the same time. Yeah. 